Hello everyone, this is Aaron, the Northern One from Broken Horse Podcast, and I am starting what will be a two-part series looking at the basics of rowing. Now, I can already hear, even as I start, across the land, indeed, across the UK, across Western Europe, across our listeners in Australia, India, China, Japan, Russia, Germany, Canada, and America, voices raised in joyous union going, what in the name of good God are you doing talking about rowing? You know nothing, man. You are a bowsider, and you are exceptionally lucky at Agecroft to be carried down the river by proper oarsmen, the likes of Ben Charles, Ali Chapman, Mark Hancock, Justin Woolley, Lewin, Sean, and everyone who basically made my life incredibly easy in a boat while I made their life incredibly difficult. Um, And you'd be right, I'm not a great rower. Uh, My 5k score was 17.09, my 2k score for the last three years at Agecroft was 6.30, uh, my 30 minute uh, rate 20 score was 8,439 meters and all of those things mean that I am a middling to average club rower I suppose and um, would have pretty freely acknowledge that I was very lucky to row with very very good people in my time. But while there's lots out there about elite level training and how the how the top boys and girls do it and how that filters down into our various squads and all of the rest of it, I haven't yet seen something that takes a nuts and bolts from the ground up approach that even looks at the basics of what an actual oar is and how we're supposed to swing it. I'm very, very fortunate in as much as I have been coached by genuinely fantastic coaches throughout um, my rowing life, starting with Kev Maynard at Agecroft, who basically put my foundations in place. Dennis O'Neill, who basically showed me that I wasn't fit enough and probably never would be for him. And then Peter Holmes, who taught me not just how to row a boat, but how to feel how a boat moves and how to row a blade in the best way to get out of the boat's way and move it down the river. And then after a long hiatus from the sport, I've been lucky enough to come back to Tyne United. I found a great group of people there and been coached by Alan Bashford and Dan Armstrong. And even now at this great age, and as I enter my period of decrepitude and decline, I'm still learning things. At the moment, things like being much, much softer with the hands at the catch and just letting the oar drop in rather than slamming it in like I'm trying to split a particularly knotty log with a particularly blunt axe has made a huge difference to the timing of the catch and drive for me. So this is basic and you might think it's very basic and there might be howls of derision across the Twitterverse, I can imagine. Stan and Hypatia going, well, good God, who let him loose on a microphone without Lewin to slap him down? But the reality is that every generation that passes thinks that they're doing it right for the first time, and every generation that learns to row thinks that they're the ones that discovered the the wheel. Um, The reality is that we often make the same mistakes in finding our way forward. Um, We go through fads, like the pause at the finish, which I have to actually say, having been taught at Agecroft that the hands come in and move out at the same speed, um, the pause is something that I've been fighting back against vehemently, but I've actually introduced it into my rowing at Tyne because there is a danger when you allow the hands to set the rate and ratio when everything is working well, it almost acts like a conductor queuing in the rest of the process, both at the catch and at the finish. But there's a tendency, unless you're doing a lot of technical work at your back end, for everything to blur together and the hands and the back to then start moving together. So by introducing the pause and then very deliberately letting the hands come back out, I'm able to sequence my back end um, much better than if I just let the hands move in and out. It obviously vanishes at higher rates because everything starts moving, but then you've set the ratio so everything works. So. This is about rowing a blade well, and if you can row a blade well, then you will move a boat well. And I happen to agree with um, Peter Holmes in that regard. A lot of what I say might feel counterintuitive to some of the orthodoxies. The reason why we have an orthodox stroke in Britain now is because GB introduced it so that it could move essentially various athletic units around from boat to boat without needing to have too much time to blend them so people could get in boats and everyone's rowing the the same stroke profile and it's easier 
for that boat to then start moving well. But if you actually look at rowing history, there is a long tradition in the UK of different areas of the country having different styles of stroke. If you look at Thames Tradesmen in the 70s when Martin Crossy was there, they have a very distinct um, shoulder profile. If you look at someone like Redgrave, who's seen as a GB rower par excellence, you can still see in the, the locked back that he has and the explosiveness of the drive that there's a lot of sprackle in there. So to move on, part one, and if you see me looking down, I'm looking down at my notes, I'm not avoiding eye contact. So number one, how an all moves a boat. So the way to look at it is in moving the boat, the oar that you have in your hands, whether you're on bow side or stroke side, the oar is a lever that works in two ways at the same time during the stroke. During the stroke, your blade is the fixed point in the water when it's in. You pull on the handle, this puts pressure against the pin, and this therefore moves the boat. Now, of course, the blade doesn't really stand still when you've got hold of the water it slips a little and it moves out from the boat and back from the catch to the finish. But in simple terms, you are rowing the boat past your blade in the water. Kev Maynard had a great visual, which was imagine two sets of iron, cast iron railings running down the side of your boat. And every time you take the catch, you're hooking your blade in, into, in between two of the railings and you're levering the boat past the blade. That's a great visual to have. It's the same if you're rowing on stroke side as well. Train tracks or cast iron railings, you come forward, you place the blade between two of the railings and the face weight on the face, pressure on the pin, and you're sliding the boat past the fixed point of the oar in the water. So in simple terms, the oar is a lever that works in two ways at the same time. Your blade is the fixed point in the water, you pull against the handle, this puts pressure on the pin, as a result, you move the boat. You are rowing the boat past your blade in the water. Because the blade is slipping in the water, what you have to learn to do is to get a grip, essentially. And, you know, we've all heard that as teenagers when your parents go, for God's sake, get a grip. The real world is coming. You'll have to work for a living and all that stuff. But to make the lever work well, to make what we've just talked about, that principle work well, you have to grip the water with your blade. Water is fundamentally unstable. So to grip it, your oar has to act like a different kind of lever at the same time. So during the stroke, the actual fixed point is the pin. You pull the handle and this drives your blade against the water. This is the connection that you will hear your coach talk about, being connected, maintaining connected. Kevin used to call it weight on the face, weight on the spoon. So you can actually feel the connection that you have. If you move an inch in the boat, you should be able to feel that connection. So when the boat is moving, you know, when you get above rate 18 and you start getting into the 20s and 30s and 40s, the water is actually racing past you really fast. So to grip it, to get that grip on it quickly, your catch has to be quick, it has to be skillful, and it has to be hard. That doesn't mean it has to be like trying to split a log, but you have to be able to feel with your hand that you've got hold of the water quickly so you can maximize the explosiveness of your legs and maximize the leg drive. The leg drive is the important thing. As rowers, we all tend to use, as we open our backs out and our arms come in, we, we tend to use the whole body to try and maintain the connection all the way through. But we've really got to maximize that first two thirds of the stroke when the legs are coming on because they So the best kind of stroke, and this is where everyone starts turning off, for me is one that makes the boat go fast. It's really as simple as that, whether you're at rate 18 or rate 38. Um, because pressure against the pin is what moves the boat, what you're looking for is maximum pressure and maximum connection from the catch to the finish. That produces the most powerful stroke. So the basis of rowing technique is to produce that from the beginning to the end of the stroke and to then to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it.
okay? So pressure against the pin is what moves the boat. Pressure against the pin with the connection with weight on the face slides the boat past the blade in the water, release, take the next stroke. Okay, so the, the whole of your rowing technique is looking to maximize your efficiency in moving the boat through the water using those fulcrums and those lever points. So the idea of rowing a blade, which is what Pete Holmes introduced me to. We tend as rowers to break things down into discrete movements and moments. The catch, the finish, the recovery, quarter slide, half slide, three quarter slide, full slide, tapping, feathering, all of those things. But the reality is that rowing when it's done well and your technique is working at a high level and it's in line with your fitness and everything is clicking, it's an unbroken flow of movements. Each movement flows smoothly on from the last and into the next one without a pause. But it's a little bit like a musical sequence in as much as every movement depends on the one before. So you have to get each one right. So let's look at some of the things that we can break down and then rebuild back up to get those things right. So let's start at backstops with the seat. Um, Talk to your boatmen, if they are a good boatman, and most of them are, and I'm saying that because I've been very lucky with having people like James Lewis in my life. Um, they will know how your boat is set up, if it's set up for unison at the front end or the back end. This is not something that most coaches will ever tell you, but the fastest way to improve your boat is to standardize the stroke, and the fastest way to do that is to standardize the finish point and the catch point. To standardize the finish point, basically what you're looking at is when everything is set up properly, as your boatman will have done it before you started fucking about with his foot plates, you should have your seat so there is about an inch of runner left behind you, so the oar is sitting in the right is sitting in the right place. I realize that my camera is badly angled, so you can't see, but basically I'm drawing up to just underneath my nipple and this hand is being the oar out there. So when I'm sat back and I'm nice and relaxed and I'm sitting upright, my everything is loose, but I'm in a nice posture, the oar is in the right place, okay? So if you all set up in whatever boat it is, whether it's a quad or a four or an eight or a double or whatever, if you all set up so that you're all at the same point at the back end, it means that when you all draw through, you'll all be releasing the boat at the same point, which really helps. As for standardizing the catch position, if you have eight 25 year olds who are all six foot five and all have 2k scores within about two seconds of each other then the standardization will happen naturally because they're all going to be about the same level of flexibility and the same level of fitness and all of the rest of it once you start getting into slightly older age groups and masters rowing which is what loon and i now occupy uh, or you have different heights and shapes in the boat or you have different levels of ability from learn to rows through to novices to club and champs all maybe getting in a boat together, everyone will be um, differently abled and have different levels of flexibility and different levels of strength. The best way to do it is to take a mean average and once you've set up off the back end, get your coach to put a piece of tape on the side of the boat where he wants the catch to be at front stops. And whether you can get more length or not, as soon as you see the loom of the oar go over that, you just raise the hands to the catch and go in. You've now standardized your finish and you've standardized your catch, which means you're all picking the boat up at the same point and you're all, put, you're all releasing the boat at the same point. It's not something that your coaches ever tell you, but technical work like that will improve your boat speed a lot more than sitting on an erg and pounding, and pounding it out. If you have a 2K score that hasn't moved for most of the last three or four years, bar one or two seconds, you can do all of the fitness work that you want but the reality is that looking at technical efficiency will get you faster, quicker than increasing your mileage. Although increasing mileage will help to drill in the technical efficiency once you've standardized things. So, you're on the seat, you're sitting at backstops. You want to be sitting comfortably upright, small of your back pressed forward a, a, a little. You are engaging your core even though you are relaxed and sitting at backstops, okay? Try not to slump, try not to curl your back as a, in a Martin Cross Thames Tradesman 1970s style. 
even when you're rowing hard because consistently good posture helps your breathing it keeps your airways open and one of Kev's sayings at Agecroft was head up airways open he had many sayings and we can play Kev bingo at some point I'm sure on the podcast but head up airways open it gets you used to swinging forward from your hips so as the hands go away the shoulders aren't being drawn forward what you're doing is you're hinging from the hip as you come forward and by getting used to what your finished position is and where you should be and learn it as a muscle memory close your eyes and feel okay which butt cheek am I on the most am I actually sitting level am I on the center line am I moving to one side or the other where am I rowing is a spatial and perceptual pursuit you should be engaging all of your senses your peripheral vision to look at where the sax board is to look at okay we're a little down on bow side I need to draw a little higher to bring us back we're a little down on stroke side so I'm just gonna dip the hand slightly and try and reset us there you're constantly you're on something that is reacting to everything that everyone in the boat is doing on a medium that magnifies those reactions so start engaging your sense your senses don't just sit in the meat wagon and pull actually feel the boat start feeling the boat and I know that sounds zen and philosophical and spiritual and Californian but actually rowing is a deeply meditative and spiritual practice as well as a physical one and everything you do in the boat whether it's an eight or a single if you do that the boat will do the boat moves if you see a you know a heron over there and you look the boat moves with it so start engaging those senses start working with the boat hands we all have them most of us anyway and we all need them to row so I am basically my hands width are so basically about a shoulder width apart probably because I have big hands it's probably about two hands width apart that I'm actually holding it at I'm not holding it like I'm carrying an axe into battle Kev used to talk about playing the piano play the piano light relaxed out in the fingers hold it out in the fingers light and relaxed why is this we are descended whether we like it or not from great apes and because of that we have a muscle memory that means that if we are about to fall out of a tree we will we will grab and hold on and our linkage in our shoulders and our elbows and our back and our hands is incredibly strong so you can afford to be loose and relaxed on your recovery you can afford to play the piano coming forward because as soon as your legs come on your hands will automatically take the strain of the catch so you don't have to grip it like your life depends on it relax drop the shoulders keep the core engaged in the tummy keep the small of the back pushed forwards relax the shoulders relax the shoulders relax the hands play the piano be as light as you can one of the things I like to do when we are warming up in, in pairs in the quad or in fours in the, in the eight is to actually just just balance the oar just let everything go and just balance the oar as I come forward just balance it out because as soon as I drop and take the catch the hands come into the right place so try that literally when other people are sitting the boat and you're doing your warm-up see how loose see see if you can just let let the oar float on the pin get used to where the balance points are get used to what it does to the set of the boat when you're balancing it on the gate okay when you grip to square and feather if we're sweep rowing which we're talking about now the orthodoxy is that you use your technical inside hand to do the squaring and feathering stuff and as Agecroft used to call it your big outside arm to do the the big pulling heavy lifting stuff if you look at some of the great Aussie rowers of the past and even Redgrave you will see footage of them actually using the outside hand to feather as well start with the orthodoxy of inside hand you will automatically bring a little bit of your outside hand in to help you out you'll either relax on it so it can turn or you might just give it a little a little twist as you're feathering and just where you're finding your balance point but do exercises for that do outside hand off inside hand on then swap it around and do outside hand and inside hand off lots of technical work you should do as, as much technical work as you do mileage okay so keep the wrists flat you will see people who pull up like that 
I have in the past been guilty of pulling up like that. Wrists, as you're on the erg, flat and parallel to the fl floor, and you're pulling through. You are pulling through flat. Why? Because it's a strong linkage. That is not a strong linkage. It's great when you're going, have you seen my dog? Yes, he's over there. How big is he? He's about this big. And all of, all of those funny things that we do. But when you're drawing through and doing that, wrists are flat, strong linkage. Center line, the center line of the boat. Lots of times in a boat, you will hear people go, oh, the boat's all over the place. Oh, the boat's down on bow side. Oh, the boat's down on stroke side. And the boat, if it would talk, if it could talk, would go, actually, I have been precision engineered by Vespoli or Empacker or Sims or Ailings or Filippi or whoever has made your boat, Shark or Hudson or whatever. I've been precision engineered so that if you push me off your landing stage, I will be perfectly balanced. It is you buggers who are making me do this all over the place. It is not the boat that is screwing up your outing. It is you, okay? First thing you can do once you've sorted out the back and the front and the standardization and what you're doing with the hands and all of those things is the center line of the boat. Keep your body over the center line of the boat. It also means if you are, you're not doing this, if you start doing this to compensate because you're pulling here or you're pulling there, you will affect the boat. If you think that your head looking at a heron or a seal will make the boat do that, then when, you're, when you start doing this with your body, the boat starts doing that. So someone in front of you then starts going to the other side to balance it. And before you know it, you've got everyone leaning all over the place and the boat going, please God, give me a decent rower. If you keep your body on the center line and everything is engaged and you are conscious of what you are doing with your body, you will mo use the muscles on both sides of your body properly. Even if you're sweep rowing and you're on bow side or stroke side, you use the muscles evenly and equally. That's the whole point of it. If you start tipping over sideways, you're not pulling as strongly and you you'll force someone else in your boat to have to compensate for you. And we've all seen it when we do the strike down and easy oars thing where we you know, strike down and hold and someone goes that way because the boat's down, which means someone has to go that way because the boat's down. Which means... So you start basically doing some kind of Latin dance in the boat. It's not good. Balance. To balance the boat, one of the simplest things that you can do, as well as standardizing your stroke at the catch and finish, making sure that everyone is rowing the same arc, catching at the same time and releasing at the same time, is the oars must be at the same height on both sides all the way through the stroke, all the way through the recovery, and all the way through the swing forward to the next stroke. Um, the easiest way to do this is to go out on the river, sit at backstops, and everyone do this with their all. Everyone, you know, up and down like that. The boat will do this. Okay, you have a X feet long length of carbon fiber with a big thing on the end of it. It's like a tightrope walker's balance pole on the gate. You can change the set of your boat just by moving your blade an inch either way. And if you're waving it around all over the place, then the boat will start to do that as well. Hands up, tips the boat away from the rigger. Hands down, tips the boat into the rigger. Get used to feeling where it is on the gate. A good way to do this, or a good thing to do with this, is to get used to applying what Pete Holmes used to call lateral pressure. So there's a tendency as we come through and we pull for the, the oar to slip towards us and to slip out of its gate a little bit, pushing outwards, applying lateral pressure so that the collar and the gate are always mated together. I'm pressing out against the pin at all times. It's keeping the button up against the swivel, especially through the finish and recovery, helps the balance because you can feel where the oar is and adjust, and it helps make your stroke more confident. Okay, so we've, we've, we've messed around with the oar, we've sorted our seat out, we've got our posture at the finish 
nice. Uh, we know what we're going to do with the awe. We've experimented with what happens when we move our hands up and down like that. Let's talk about the hands away and the swing. So. Body upright, back stops. Start from back stops. Everyone press down and release at the same time. Hands come forward, blade heights are all the same. Get whoever isn't bow to go to start calling people out. Blade height, blade height, blade height. Blade heights are the are my my biggest bugbear. That and blades on the water. If you're working really hard in a race and you've you're putting everything in, the last thing that you want is for your blade to touch down on the recovery because you're scrubbing all the speed off that you've just you've just invested in that last stroke. Okay, so legs are flat, arms are loosely straight, never lock your elbows at the back. Blade is feathered, handle is just above the sax board. Okay, great, still with me. Press the small of your back towards your thighs. This isn't a large movement, it's not exaggerated. What you're doing is you are maintaining the engagement of your core, okay? So you're coming into a good, strong position. You let your knees relax and rise naturally, okay? Keep your head up and your shoulders relaxed. Relax the shoulders, relax, you don't, it might be a, a, a man thing, but rowing is, can be very, look at my biceps, look at how hard I'm pulling. It doesn't matter how big your biceps are, they're never gonna match your um, legs for explosive power. Your legs are seven times more powerful than your arms. Relax the arms. Okay, just relax the arms. Head up, shoulders relaxed, reach over the knees. Okay, so you're just going, you've got to let the hands work on your flexibility. Let the hands go towards your ankles. Okay, let the hands go towards your ankles before the knees break and rise. Then, you, then your hands and shoulders are all set in the right position. Okay, rather than having to go up and over the knees like you see people do at the gym. Press down, hands away, hinge from the hips, once the arm is set, let it go towards the ankles as much as you can, re as much as you can so that you're set in a strong position. And then once, once you're there, your knees will naturally, will naturally rise and you will compress forward. Okay, so you're swinging from your hips rather than curling down into the stroke. Strike down, hands away. Hinge from the hips, hinge from the hips, reach towards the ankles, let the knees break naturally and let yourself compress and float forward. So you start to slide as the knees break naturally. Control the slide, okay? Don't hold your knees down until they hurt. Um, don't hold the fixed body angle as you slide. If you look at Eric Murray's Sensei workouts, he talks about being about 80% set off the back because you will naturally, as you come forward, depending on what the boat is doing and how you feel, you will naturally get into the right position once you know what it is. So you're not looking to be locked as you come forward and you're kind of desperately holding it. It's relaxed, you're flowing forward, okay? Let the knees rise steadily. Slide speed. We were always taught feel, feel, feel for the first turn of the wheel, wheel, wheel. Okay, so you should be controlling the slide. You should be controlling the slide. Don't let it speed up or slow down. You don't want to be jerking forward or anything like that. You want to just let it float forward into the right position. Keep the knees the same distance on each side of the center line as they rise so that when you take the catch, you are using the power in both legs evenly to drive off the stretcher. If you're a bow sider, that means not favoring the left side because it's closer to try and pull round. You're gonna drive like you're squatting or like you're on an erg. You're pushing, you're pushing the legs down. The less you can twist the hips and lower spine, the better. It's gonna protect you from injury in the long run. And if you work on keeping and maintaining an equal pressure on the foot plate as you come forward and driving evenly as you drive back, then that means you're not favoring e either side. You're not gonna get a compensatory injury. Now, as you come forward, your legs will naturally move apart as you slide, but they'll, they should stay about a shoulder width apart. If you look at some rowing photographs, you can see some amazing shots of knees up around 
ears and, and people, get, you know, especially in master's drawing, get, getting their big kites, as they're called in the northeast, between their legs and the, the legs end up going apart like they're giving birth. Work on your flexibility, work on keeping your knees about shoulder width apart. Don't let your outside leg flop over and away from the rigger. Try and keep them parallel. Some rowers keep their knees together. Matthew Pinson is one. Um, ben Charles is slightly less celebrated than Matthew Pinson, even though I, you know, consider that he probably could have taken him over 2K. Uh, he did the same. He kept his knees together and went round the outside. Same as Matt. But generally, the outside arm will pass, if these are your knees, the outside arm will pass between them like that, okay? Compression. There used to be a poster in the um, dressing room at Agecroft and it was the famous one of Lord Kitchener from World War One, and somebody had removed uh, Kitchener's face and put Dennis's face there and it basically said rather than your country needs you it says gentlemen of Agecroft Dennis O'Neill needs you to row longer and pull harder which was um, we used to joke that his only two coaching calls were row longer and pull harder. In my case, it was also Aaron tap down, but uh, that's doing Dennis a massive disservice. But there was an orthodoxy at, at the time that if length is good, then more length is better. It's not. If you look at Andy Hodge and Pete Reed and Alex James and um, Alex Gregory in the 2012 Olympic final, even though they are GB rowers, they are actually rowing a very Spracklin-esque stroke in as much as they are rowing an efficient length. I mean, it's a brilliant its a brilliant performance and you should watch it anyway because that is how you move a four. But over compression is not a good thing. Grabbing more length just because you can is not a good thing. Okay, so in your compression, don't slide too far. A good guide is shins vertical. If they go beyond vertical, then you are entering into a negative leverage point. But if you, if you get to the vertical, your legs can move faster and harder from an open angle and less sliding lets you swing over your knees and get the natural length of your stroke. And the natural length of your stroke is the most efficient length of your stroke. Trying to get more length at the catch means you have to work harder from a negative position before everything starts coming on and background to the finish. If you slide too far, your body tips back so you can't use your bum muscles and your back muscles properly. You end up bouncing off front stops and your catch becomes soft and sloppy because you're, you're, oh, you're, you're lurching into it. So you're looking at all points of the stroke to know what you're doing, to know what you're doing at the finish, to know what you're doing at the catch. You're not letting the boat tell you what to do. You are The boat knows how to row. That's what it's been designed for. You are telling the boat what to do by doing the right things with it. And that means being in control of your finish and being in control of your catch. Shoulders and arms. This is more for the men because we men at any age like to go, look at my biceps. Have you seen my dog? He's about this big. All of that stuff. It's absolute nutter nonsense. Keep the shoulders low and relaxed. Relaxed and level. Piano with the fingers on the recovery. Relaxed and level shoulders. Don't let the outside shoulder drop. Don't let the inside shoulder hunch up because you're trying to you're trying to wrestle with the oar and wrestle with the boat. The outside shoulder naturally follows the hand around. Agecroft used to talk about the big outside arm and everyone used to take the piss out of us because they went, oh, Agecroft, bash and crash merchants, big outside arm, draw up, tap down, high averages, no mistakes, all of the things that we play on Kev Bingo. Um, 
the big outside arm call, and this is a good one for standardizing calls, like everyone talks about, oh, quick catches, quick catches. Well, what does that actually mean? If you ask eight rowers who come from different parts of the country, what are quick catches? It depends on their coaching. The best thing you can do as a coach in a boat is actually decide what the catchphrases mean so that you're not playing coaching mood music. You're not, oh, quick catches, everyone, quick catches, spin the hands, spin the hands. What does that actually mean? Let's define what it means for our boat, okay? And one of those things with regard to the Adrikov big outside arm call, it wasn't to draw, it wasn't to pull with the outside arm and have a big heaved finish and maintain the connection by bringing the shoulders in. It was a call to maintain the core posture locked and the outside of the body to be as high as possible so that we are drawing through flat to the right point in the finish. It wasn't a physical call, it was a technical call. So, hands and shoulders and arms relaxed, relax, relax, relax. Nice level plane, big outside arm, keep the outside of the body high, keep the core engaged so that when the legs come on, we feel weight on the face, we can feel it in our fingertips. Weight on the face comes right the way through and we draw through to the right plane. Try to keep the inside arm straight, relax it a little bit, but what you're looking for is what Pete Holmes used to call retarding the inside arm was just allowing it to relax when you're on that dry phase. It doesn't, so that it doesn't have to be completely straight and you're not, it's not unnatural. You're just looking for the best way to get yourself in the position to take a strong catch. And what to do that, you're looking to keep the shoulders level. You're not turning into the stroke and dipping down, you're staying upright and in a good position. With me so far? I bet you're glad that you came along to this. So, in the next part of this, next week, we will talk about things like the stretcher and squaring and the float and the catch and the drive. And so, I'm glad that you've. Uh, had a listen or a watch of this this is up on our youtube channel as well and i hope it's not too basic for you and i hope that there are uh, there are things you can take forward from it and uh, use in your own rowing and don't worry lewin will be back at some point to talk about proper rowing stuff <laughs>